fun. Wonderful. Of course. Thank you so much for doing this. So exciting. And uh, now we're live. Hey, everyone. Um, welcome to One Table Live featuring Mike Salamanov and Jake Cohen. We are here talking all things Shabbat. Uh, my name is Zoe. I'm from the One Table team, and I'm so excited to be introducing this panel of you know, all-stars who are cooking amazing, amazing Jewish and Israeli food. So by way of introductions a little bit, um, I'll tell you about One Table. So One Table is a nonprofit um, on a mission to inspire and support people everywhere, um, helping them slow down, unplug, and really develop a lifelong Shabbat practice rooted in that Friday night Shabbat dinner. Um, we're all about connection. So we invite you to connect, to connect to each other, to ritual, to wellness, all through Shabbat, um, all while you kind of hold tradition in one hand and then your beliefs, your experiences, your values, your passions in the other. Um, to get us started tonight, I'll share a few key pieces of information that will help you connect to one another, get the most out of this, and, and help you Shabbat. So hopefully you can see the chat box um, on your Zoom account. So there are a few options here. You can chat to um, all the panelists or everyone in the meeting. We encourage you to message all the guests. Um, get to know one another. Let us know where you're tuning in from, what your name is, anything like that. Definitely connect. Um, and as always, please abide by our code of conduct, which I will drop in the chat here. Um, simply put, be kind to one another. Um, Awesome to see people tuning in from all across the country. Hey, everybody. <laughs> um, there's also a Q&A option. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll see Q&A. And if you have any questions that you want Mike or Jake to answer, please use that feature and then use the chat box to connect with one another. So tonight, we'll learn a little bit about how Mike approaches Shabbat and cooking Shabbat dinner. And then tomorrow, Friday, we'll welcome Shabbat together across the world. Um, no matter where you are in the world, in time, whether there are 15 people at your table, which probably isn't happening these days, um, so maybe there are 15 people on your screen, or you're lighting candles for one, Shabbat is really a moment to carve out some space for yourself, um, for your friends, for your family, however you want to connect to something greater, um, we invite you to slow down a little bit. And one table is still here to support the magic of Shabbat, so while we're protecting the health and safety of one another. Um, we're asking that you only host for yourself, the people you live with, or do something virtual. But regardless of what you're doing, we are here to nourish you. Um, and we wanted to keep hosting during this time. In addition, each week we host a few dinners on One Table Live, so you can always check out the upcoming schedule, which I'll also drop in the chat box here. Um, and now, I'm so excited to turn it over to Mike, who's a five-time James Beard award-winning chef and author, as well as Jake, who is the editorial director at the Feed Feed, as well as a One Table host, guest, and board member. Um, thank you all for joining. Mike and Jake, over to you. Woo! Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Mike. I'm so excited. When I heard about this, it was just, what a perfect way to kind of bring in Shabbat. We were just talking about the kind of concept of we are home more and finally using our kitchens and cooking for ourselves and our families. So before we get into this menu, I'd love to know a little bit about what life is like for you right now. Well, life, I, well, first of all, thank you guys so much for having me. I'm honored. I mean, I do think that life for all of us is about trying to figure out what it means to stay connected and connectivity and you know, sort of by, I'm a very physical person and I'm a people person and I have very little patience um, for technology. So it's been torture. Um, obviously being away from Zahab and um, our whole team has been really difficult. And then there's the, you know, the sort of threat of everything that we've ever worked for going under, which is terrifying. I will say I've been cooking more than I ever have in, in terms of like home cooking, spending great, great time with um, like my kids. And uh, I don't know, my business partner and I live a block away from each other. 
and there's a huge park that is right in between us. So we spend a lot of time walking around the park, six feet apart from each other. So life is crazy for everybody. For restaurants, it's like doubly crazy. Um, but I guess that we're all sort of in it together. And Jake, when have we spent so much time together? I yeah. ask you. I love right? it. I love it. It's, it's been like a few minutes here, a few minutes there. You got, I got you for a full hour today. <laughs> Yeah, but thank you so much. Yeah, um, so we're gonna do a couple very simple things tonight. Um, I have to stress, like there are recipes, there are guidelines, but we're all quarantined. And also, you know, having a pantry box that is full, well, mine is actually, it's like embarrassing how little I actually have in my house, but I like to improvise, so that's my point. We're gonna go through all this. If you guys have the stuff to make all this, great, if not, don't worry about it. We're going to make everything very delicious. All right. Um, we're going to make schnitzel, which is like my favorite thing of all times. We're going to make a pilaf uh, that has got kale in it, which is good if you have spinach, if you have any other greens, even like wilted arugula works great. We're going to make just a little bit of prepared trina sauce, which will go great on the schnitzel, very cold at 4 a.m. tonight. Um, and then we're just going to make a little chopped salad, like an Israeli salad. Okay. Perfect. So that, all right. Now, we're gonna go through all this. Like I said, I'm a very big fan of improv. And I also think in these trying times of inaccessibility, it's really about making use of what you have in your kitchen, okay? So as I cook, Jake, any questions you have, if people are writing in and asking questions, let's do it. We'll answer these. Well, wow, sounds good. All right, all right good. Up. So what we're gonna do first is actually, we're gonna batter our schnitzel. Now, most people think that, sh that the proper breading procedure is flour, egg wash, breadcrumbs. I actually like to just use the egg wash okay. um, as the brine for the chicken. Um, and I don't use any flour. I just go egg wash and then straight matzo meal, which provides a really thin, beautiful yeah. crust. We're just gonna crack some eggs in here. Um, I guess that got me thinking like, why don't people make more matzo meal schnitzel for Passover? I don't know because it is literally the best, in my opinion, it's the best expression of matzo meal. Um, and it makes perfect, I mean, even in our restaurants, not for Pesach, we use matzo meal. So I definitely would recommend it. So I go a little salt, eggs, okay? Now I've got a little bit of Lior's hawaj, he has Yemenite soup. So hawaj means curry, basically, or it means the same thing as baharat. It's just like a blend of spices. What we think of when we think of halaj is this turmeric, cumin, black pepper situation. It's a uh, one part black pepper, two parts turmeric, two parts ground cumin. Okay, or you can uh, check out the Boda piece and get this delivered to your door. All right, you obviously know Lior really, really well. Amazing stuff. He makes the best. His baharat is also one of my favorite. It's super good. You know, his baharat is good for sweet and savory, yeah. which I like. Well, that, so we're just gonna, I don't know if you remember, but that was actually the first time we met was when you came to Tasting Table and to make, you made baharat donut holes, which just blew yeah. on who the hell is using baharat in donut holes. But um, my favorite expression of baharat is by Zach Engel, um, who refer, he calls it um, Middle Eastern pumpkin spice. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that was a big honest Ortoon thing as well, too. So she's, um, yeah, Baharat is, does everything. Baharat literally does everything. And it's, um, it's like, the funny thing is the Baharat that we know is the sweet Baharat that's got the cinnamon in it as well. But there's like 20 different kinds. Yeah. Um, there's a coffee Baharat, just like a coffee halaj. So we're going to go um, chicken. Now, I actually use chicken breasts from uh, Grow and Behold, which happens to be got kosher. I am not kosher, this is not a kosher home. I think Grow and Behold has the best chicken ever. And it comes in, the thing about kosher everything meat is that it's already salted a little bit too, which is great, okay? Which is like nice and briny. We're gonna add a touch of salt. We got a touch of the hoaj in there, a little bit of egg. We're just gonna let it kind of hang out for a while. Now the beautiful thing about this is that this can actually sit brined in the egg for like four hours, 
which is awesome. This is only gonna go for a little bit, it's good, but you actually can season the uh, chicken with the spices in this egg wash, which I think is fantastic. You know, the beautiful thing about Israeli cuisine is that it contradicts everything that our culinary school te teachers taught us in culinary school, you know, because you would never add salt and spices or sugar or anything to eggs and let it sit. Correct. But European chefs don't do that. And like Israeli grandmas are like, throw it in there and let it chill. Huh. Probably at room temperature, okay. right? right? Yeah. So we're gonna let that sit. Now while that's happening, we're gonna slice up our onions for the pilaf. Um, and I like rice to me, rice schnitzel pina is what you get in every single gas station in Israel and it's freaking amazing, right? So we're gonna do this. Um, we're gonna just start with a little bit of browned onions and brown garlic. Now, right now, if you guys don't have that, that's okay. If you've got scallions, that's totally cool. If you've got um, carrots, you know, like even those little crappy peeled carrots that you feed your kids, those make perfect sofritos and perfect starters for rice. Um, Jake, as you know, well, your, your Persian rice is like next level too, but I love carrots and rice. Love it, love it, love it. I feel like the way that it sort of Mimic saffron is really um, like wonderful. It's like sweet and aromatic. Starting pilaf with olive oil and carrots makes a fantastic fragrant rice. So if you've got that great, we're gonna just slice this up. Um, Shake your chicken breast feet when you're doing schnitzel. And are you doing like slices or are you pounding out breasts? So I use slices. Um, I don't I don't pound them out. I, I actually prefer the I don't want it to be super wide. Mm. That I have an issue with because the edges get really nice and crispy and then the interior gets kind of flabby. So I just butterfly the chicken, okay? Which I think and you can honestly cut chicken strips, like this makes a very good chicken tender. I was we I, all pretend, you know. I have schnitzel fingers in my cookbook. Dude, schnitzel fingers are amazing. All right, so listen, we're gonna go onions in here. I'm gonna um, throw in some olive oil, but we're not gonna salt this, okay? We want them, we want the onions to brown, um, and salt is not gonna help you out with that. Let me get this on the stove. Okay, great. So while that's cooking, let's peel a little bit of garlic as well. Um, and if you've got, if you don't have fresh, you can use a little garlic powder too. That's totally cool. To me, the kale though is what makes this really, really special. Um, this also works really well with like frozen English peas, um, which I know everybody has like a weird feeling about, but frozen peas can be very- I fun. love frozen peas. I use them. Yeah. Actually, that was one of the first things I stocked up on. It was pasta and like frozen peas and frozen corn. What's your frozen pea uh, go-to recipe? Uh, it would, there were two. It's like, I'm one of those very classic, like throw it in carbonara, even if Italians hate it. Uh, yeah. And then it's, it's just like, I would make risotto a lot now. It's yeah. I'm just throwing anything. It's spring here, sort of. I haven't seen it, but. I know, I don't even know. Like, I'm seeing pictures of ramps on Instagram and I haven't. Yes, seen. yes. Um, I will say one of the, like, great things ever was um, Michael Anthony from Dermot Tavern uh, tipped me off at some of the farms, like Norwich Mill Farms at the Green Market, um, delivering to people's homes now during this. Yeah. Time. So I got. You know what? I'm actually jealous of all my friends in New York because Norwich Farms is unreal. Unreal. Sorry. The biggest delivery, I mean, I have like radishes the size of my head, things like that. Yeah. That was very exciting, even though like you can't find uh, anything. So Jake, tell me about your, your rice. How did you get so into Persian rice? So it's, I mean, I'm Ashkenazi. I've never heard of it, seen it, um, and not even like an Ashkenazi that came from a family that explored other cuisines. It was just yeah. very much like lots of soup and brisket and latkes. Um, but when I met my husband who comes from this very, very background, his family is Iraqi Jewish, but his mother and her generation all grew up in Iran. So he grew up having 
kubba and uh, tadig and all of the Persian yeah. stews. So it was one of the first things. Um, I mean, I, I've written about this a lot, but like there was this huge kind of debate between us because when we met, he had no idea what babka was. He had never heard or had babka before. And I thought that was yeah. so, so weird. But at the same time, I had never heard of kubba. I didn't know what gourmet sabzi was. And these were all the things that he knew like, like at his core. Um, yeah. So naturally I learned, started learning how to make all of them, kind of learning with his aunt and his mother. That's the best. That's the best. Iraqi and Iranian food is like my favorite. You know what? They just go big on like sweet and sour, you know? Yeah. Like super big. It's not, doesn't even really taste Middle East. I mean, Iraqi more so, but it doesn't even, it's like something else, you know? 100%. All right, so listen, I went um, sliver garlic, I went black pepper, and we're going to cook this down a little bit. Okay, so some questions coming at you. Someone yeah. asking for Hawaii, what your ratio would be to substitute? Two parts ground uh, cumin, two parts ground turmeric, one part ground black pepper. Amazing. And then yeah. someone asked about the name of the store. It's La Boite. Yeah. La Boite is good. Um, maybe we'll make a little bit of peanut sauce right now. What I'm going to do, though, is before I juice these lemons, I don't have any fancy rasp investor. All right, in a fancy rest, master. I have such a crappy kitchen, by the way. You know, you guys all get to see it. But what I'm going to do is, before I juice these, I'm going to just skin a little bit of this lemon peel, and we're going to use that to help sort of wake up the rice after the kale goes in. Now, when you're doing this, hold, there you go, hold it, and then just twist. All right. Beautiful, and that way you guys don't get too much pith. A little bit of pith is okay. Let's go. Someone's saying zesters are the best. You're right, zesters are the best. I wish I had them. Um, so we're gonna roll these lemons out. Someone wants to know this. I, I've never played around with a lot of like these Manischewitz products, but if they could use matzo cake meal. So matzo cake meal, actually, I have heard of because it makes a really good chocolate chip cookie, like a Pesachi chocolate chip cookie. Um, I wouldn't do that. I feel like it would get a little bit too, um, too like, what's the word that I'm making? It, it would get too cakey, you know, and you don't want that. You want crisp and you want the uh, interior to be really, really tender. And then you want the exterior to be like crackly, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so listen, I'm rolling these lemons out too. And this is, I always do this, it extracts better juice. Um, and if you're using the peel too, it kind of wakes up the oil a little bit. All right, so we're gonna split this guy. We're gonna get one in this service. Two questions. One, yeah. use chicken thighs. Could you go dark meat? So you could go dark meat. And as a food person, I love the idea of dark meat chicken thighs. I will say, I feel like schnitzel kind of, chicken schnitzel, like Israeli style chicken schnitzel, I feel like just makes more sense when it's chicken breast. That's just what I'm used to. Chicken thighs do make a really good, um, Hard as well, though. I think they're really good. What you want to do, though, is really make sure you remove the sinew of some of the gnarly pieces of meat and fat um, that don't eat super well. Okay, like you want to trim it off so it's really clean. And if you need to sort of pound it out or butterfly it, it's definitely important uh, because what you don't want to do is get too much like chew in the schnitzel. The worst part, and this is why I think it's brilliant. Um, to not do the flour egg wash breadcrumbs because I hang on one second. Um, because what you want to do, you want the breading to be on the chicken as you're biting it. There's nothing worse than eating like anything Milanese, right? And you go to eat it and all the breading like pulls off and there's just like straight meat. It sucks, you know? So you want it to be really nice and even, and you want the, the crispy layer to be really, really nice and thin. All right. Um, okay. So we've got lemon. 
We've got garlic. Should I make the tina with garlic or without, Jake? What do you think? Oh, definitely with garlic. A lot garlic? of garlic. Okay. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Blender. Garlic. Now, what I would do if I were you, if you guys use a ton of lemon, get one of these, like, citrus things. They are brilliant, okay? Boom. Squeeze this guy out. I think the misconception about tina and also even hummus is that it has to be this like big garlic lemon balm. It's really not it. I mean, I like plenty of acid and, and brightness to my tina, but it shouldn't be super astringent. What we're going to do is puree the lemon and the garlic and let it sit for a second. And that's going to mellow the garlic and like cook it for a second so you don't have stinky garlic breath for all of your relatives in your like yeah, little so confined going on any situation. Day. So what we're gonna do is buzz this guy up. All right, and then we're gonna let it sit. I'm also I'm gonna throw a little bit of cumin in there too, a little bit of ground cumin, which is optional. All right, a little bit of salt. We're gonna puree it, and then we're just gonna let it chill for a sec, all right? Um, Okay, so while that's sort of ceviche, we're gonna take our onions here, all right, that are brown and really, really nice. Really now, does not have to be perfect at all. Let me show you. Gorgeous. Okay. Good stuff. Okay, and then what we're gonna do is actually add our salt. Remember, we didn't wanna add the salt right away. That kind of slows down the caramelizing process. We're gonna go salt, and we're gonna do our kale here too. This is about two cups of chopped kale. Like I said, spinach. I use um, wilted arugula, you know, cause I get like these five pound bags of greens that nobody could possibly eat. Yeah. And even on its way out, this makes a great sort of base for a pilaf. You could use carrots. We're just gonna saute this for one second. Move this back over the stove for a second. And then what we're gonna do is actually add the rice and add some liquid. Now, I call for chicken stock. I have no chicken stock. We're just gonna go water. It's gonna yeah. be totally fine. Maybe we'll add some more black pepper and salt. It should be great. Um, and then we're gonna whip up this peanut, all right? We have a few questions about making this vegetarian for the schnitzel concept in the sense of, are there any vegetables that you would brown? Oh my God, eggplant, amazing. Oh, eggplant. Amazing, eggplant. amazing. I mean, oh. yeah, eggplant makes the best schnitzel. Um, what I would do is take the eggplant, peel it. I would then salt it, mm -hmm. like a low intensity salt sort of overnight. And then I would kind of like squeeze it out and rinse it and then go egg wash matzo meal. It's out of control good. Because that's, that's actually what my mother-in-law does when she makes her dolma, is she takes the eggplant and lets it sit in egg forever. Oh my God, it's the best, right? Um, all right, so, and then also like, I, we played around with different vegetables like celery root and stuff like that. Um, Andrew Parmolini uh, does this fantastic celery root milanese, which I tried to mimic. I don't know if I've gotten it just yet. So, you guys see this? Love that cup. Looking good right here. Now, if you guys wanted to go no uh, no starch or anything with this dish, uh, you could just, you could honestly just like crack an egg and stir it up and make like a little Persian like omelet situation, those uh -oh. really herbaceous omelets. Um, or you could cook this out a little bit more and just serve it chilled. Really, really good. All right, so we're going to add a touch more oil. And you can just use shraggy olive oil. You don't need to use anything fancy for this. <laughs> All right, we're gonna, we're gonna add our rice now. I I soak this rice, um, mm -hmm. and it's just jasmine. Is there a reason for jasmine? Do you have like preferences when it comes to rice? Is it just because it's peel off? I like I like every kind of rice. I really really do. I think that for the there's like a chewiness to jasmine and an aroma mm -hmm. that I really appreciate. Basmati is also magical. Carolina Gold is great. There's this um. Oh, Egyptian rice is sick. It's like sushi rice. Have you ever had that? 
Have you ever, oh my God, it's amazing. He makes the best makluba, it makes the best um, stuffing for the omadas because it's like super, super starchy. Um, oh, I love that. Yeah, and it's like usually like way cheaper in like the Middle Eastern supermarket than like a sushi, like where you get like fancy Japanese food. Um, yes. Okay, so this, so I've soaked this too. You don't have to soak it. I, I like to soak it because it makes the cooking time a little bit quicker and you actually have to add like less liquid. So this is about two cups. I'm gonna start with just over two cups of water and we'll see what happens. Do you salt the water when you soak it? What'd you say? Do you season the water that you soak the rice in? Um, I don't do that, but I go pretty heavy on like this part of it. Mm. Yeah. Um, there is this amazing rice that's actually from New Jersey. I don't know if you know this, but there are, are rice patties in New Jersey. And there's a rice, there's a company called Blue Moon Acres, which is a hydroponic farm, and they make the sickest rice. It's like an onion. I'm, okay, I'm writing that down now. I think that's so cool. I, I feel like, Jake, when we actually have like Shabbat together, you know, we're going to have to, we're going to have to, it's just going to be a rice bomb. We're just going to like, wolf it on rice. I'm throwing a little bit of lemon peel. Okay, I'm rubbing it a little bit to get some of the oil out. We're going to throw in just three pieces of it. We're gonna go a little bit more pepper, a little bit more salt, and we're gonna give it a stir. Now, I don't wanna to agitate too much. I just wanna let it kind of absorb, and then we're gonna blast it on the stove. It probably is gonna need a little bit more water, but I'd rather have it rest longer than have yeah. it be like gummy, you know what I mean? A proper resting for rice. We're not gonna be able to do it here, but a lot of people, will wrap their pots with wool cloth and let it sit for like three hours, you know? So we're just gonna go here. Blue Moon Acres, very excited about that. Yeah, very, very good. Okay, so we've got that guy cooking. Hang on for one second. Love it. I'm seeing everyone's questions for everyone watching. Throw them in. I'll throw them out to Mike as they're coming. What are, the, what are the questions, Jake? Hit me. So, few are about um, the brand of tahini you like the best, and what are the kind of brands both like from Israel as well as domestically? Okay, so there's, there's two kinds that I would definitely recommend. One is Sum, which we all like, is our people. They're on. Um, yeah, Sum, that's uh, the Zeitelman sisters. They are actually their company is based in Philadelphia, serendipitously enough. They get their seeds from Ethiopia. They are processed in Nazareth and they distribute here. They've got amazing trina. Um, they've got a chocolate trina. They import their own Ceylon date molasses. Ridiculously good. You can buy it on Amazon. Usually it also like tells you to buy our cookbook with it. You may or may not. Um, and then there's also, um, uh, there's uh, Habracha, right? Which is what I'm using right now, Habracha, which is actually Samaritan, you know the good Samaritan? It's actually made by Samaritans. That, that's my favorite. Whenever, I mean, everyone I know who's Israeli, when they go home, they come back with like two jars of that in their suitcase. That's really, really good. There's also a brand um, called Al Ars, which is amazing also from Nazareth too. And then there's a, I can't remember the name of it. Is it, it's like, it's got a pigeon on the front of it, basically. And you can also find that in Israel. Very good. What's nice is now we're in this, we've got this luxury of being able to get these products here. Whereas before it would be like every time one of my relatives would visit, like it would just be Yemenite spice, like their clothes would smell terrible all the time. And if like, God forbid the Trina would like leak in their luggage. Oh my God. <laughs> Testing it while slicked like underwear for three weeks, you know? Um, all right, so listen, the rice is steaming right now. I, I kind of cranked it. Um, of course, I put it in a pan that I don't have the right, correct lid for. So we're going to keep our fingers crossed. Um, I'm bringing it up high and then I'm going to drop it drop it down low. And we're going to see how that oh. goes. And while that's happening, we're going to whip up our clean eye. Now remember, um, we let our garlic and our lemon and our salt and our cumin kind of like blend. 
um, to, to chill, to mellow the, the garlic, okay? We don't want a big garlic bomb. Okay, if you're into garlic, that's fine. I don't love the taste of raw garlic all the time. Um, we're gonna shake, I have this guy upside down. This is a pretty old jar, so we'll see what happens. The problem with Trina is that um, it separates sometimes and you end up with like uh, dull sesame oil and then you end up with like silly putty at the bottom. So, exactly. Yeah, so we're gonna give this a little stir. Seems to be okay. A little bit. So it's a little chunky and that's okay. We're just gonna dig it out. Now what I do with my tina, even when I'm making hummus, I always start with this prepared tahina, okay? Because what I want is a nice, fluffy, moussey, like creamy sauce. I don't like doing that like hummus making chicken where you like throw in tina into a hot like roboku with chickpeas and sort of close your eyes and pretend that like you're gonna get a good result. We don't want that. What I want is this really nice stable sort of base that I can make um, you know, like a green goddess dressing. If I decide to throw an avocado and herbs in there, I can add pistachios to it and then sauce lamb with it. We can do walnuts and fish. Like I want, I want that. I want to be able to go into my fridge and have this fantastic sauce. And the way to do that, as we all know, is with like tons of ice water, you know? So even yeah. when your tahina has been sitting on a shelf for God knows how long, you can dig it up. We can add some ice water to this and then we're going to blend it up to get the consistency that we want, okay? So, throw some of that in there. This is a quick tahina. What does a long tahina look like? Uh, the long tahina is like, is, this is a, this is our basically on the way to being quick hummus, which we're not gonna complete. What you would do to this, is, at the end of it, is basically add a can of chickpeas, and that would be our hummus. Um, our quick tahina is this. The long tahina is taking whole garlic with the skins, and mashing it with a lemon juice and letting it like sit for hours and hours and then screening it out. But I don't want to do that. We're all at home. I don't need any more dishes, right? We got to like knock this out, you know? All right, so we've got our tina right here. We're going to add just a shot of water to it. Um, my ice cubes that come out of my fridge um, are like ginormous, so we're not going to use those. I'm just going to use really, really cold water. It's funny when you do this in home after quarantine, you know, like every single cookbook is like, go to your local fishmonger. First of all, there's no more fishmongers, A. No. B, you're not going to freaking Whole Foods right now to go buy a no. fish, you know? And I'm like, what we're definitely not doing is talking about a specific like shape of ice, you know? You're gonna make uh, this happen. Yes. I'm gonna blend this, give me one sec, right? Talk okay. about different else. All right, so you saw a little bit of tina and not enough water, it looks pretty much like shit. Now that the reason is is because this is all fat, okay? And this is okay. the issue that everybody has when working with tina is if you don't if you don't aerate it, it's not gonna be good. Okay, so we're gonna add a little bit more water to it. All right, a touch more salt. And we're gonna get this really nice and sort of moussey and beautiful thing about treating it this way with the lemon and the garlic is that it's not gonna continue to ferment in your fridge. So you can make this once a week. It can be a base for hummus. You can make a vegan creamy salad dressing. You can do whatever you want with it and it's all good. All right, so let's blend it. Going through the questions, the garlic was blended. <laughs> Let's see. All right, so check it out. Spoon. Gorgeous. Hey, all right, good stuff. Okay, so as I said to you, like I make all of my dressings in my house. Like yesterday, actually, I just took ground peanuts and lime juice and just made like a dressing with this for, for kale. Really awesome, really good base, and it's also vegan, which um, is cool, right? Because all your vegan friends will be impressed with you 
And that's I see chicken that's all. Right? Okay, so let's see. Let me just take a quick peek at my rice. We have someone who's very, very um, passionately needing to know the chicken brand again. Okay, so the chicken brand, so I get it from Grow and Behold, which is got kosher. I believe there's like another, it's like an Amish chicken, um, but it's got kosher. It's, a, it's like ridiculous, like best chicken ever. Really, really good. And what we're gonna actually do is we're gonna bread this up real quick. So it's been in our like egg wash brine. Remember, you can use whatever spices you want in your egg. If you like the cumin, great. I actually took sesame seeds and whole cumin seeds and put it in matzo meal and had this sort of like whole seed crusty situation that was fantastic. I encourage you to do that. If you like caraway, go for it. If you, um, if you like sesame seeds, if you like nigella seeds, throw them in the matzo meal. It is like fantastic and fun. I want to grind bisley, the Israeli snack food. I want to grind bisley and put that in matzo meal. I feel like that would be the best quarantine. That's that. good chicken fingers right there. That right? is great fingers. Ooh. Yeah. It's America. Cool Ranch Doritos, dude. Grind them up. <laughs> throw them in the matzo meal. It's gonna, yeah. oh, that's gas station schnitzel for you. Yeah, that is gas station schnitzel. What I'm gonna do now, remember, we're, we're not doing flour, we're only doing egg wash. And we're just doing that. We're gonna throw it into the matzo meal right here. Um, of course, I don't have any containers in my house that are big enough to do this food because this is real right now. I'm shocked that like a UPS driver hasn't shown up in the middle of this. Oh my God, I start it happens every time I go live. I get like a call from the doorman or such. <laughs> My sister just shows up. Like it just happens. And I think that's part of like the beauty of this time is everything. Oh, yeah. So I, like I mean, I was like very, very hesitant to even put clothes on. I know we're all in sweatpants right now, and I wanted to be like in the um, spirit of Israeli everything. I just want to be like underdressed, you know. <laughs> um, so, like very, very light breading with this, which is the key in my opinion. What have been, everyone wants to know what's been kind of your favorite quarantine meals you've been making at home for your family. Honestly, as I said, I've never really cooked as much as I have been now. And so I've, I've done pretty, I made makluba, you know, which is uh, the sort of upside down rice situation. I made that with mushrooms and the bottom layer was like mushrooms where the meat was. Um, my favorite meal though, I, you know, I made challah with the kids and made French toast with that. That was good. That's Definitely great. Definitely made that in a bathrobe. Um, I made uh, some focaccia pizza that was like, a, mm -hmm. you know, delicious. Really, really good. I made some Romanian kebabs two nights ago in the boiler in my oven, which I didn't even know actually worked. They were delicious. Those are good too. Do you like Romanian kebabs or no? Have you had them before? Yeah, yeah Romanian I mean and Bulgarian kebabs are my favorite. They're like sweet really good. Um, all right, so I think the rice should almost be done. What we're going to do is take a gander. Yeah, it's almost done. Unbelievable, Amazing. guys. Here, I'm going to show this to you real quick, and then we're going to let it rest while we chop up our salad and then fry our shrimp. Now, the key to rice, like especially you can see it's almost under, almost undercooked, mm -hmm. just slightly. But what we're going to do is let this sit covered and let it carry over. Now that is, it's the way that we like treat meat when you rest it, you do the same thing with grains, okay? You yeah. don't wanna just start mixing them up, okay? So we're gonna keep them covered, we're gonna let them carry over, we're gonna chop up our salad, all right? Now you can use like honestly whatever you want. I mean the classic, you know, Israeli salad is like cucumber, tomato, um, but I put whatever I have. We're going to do parsley in this. We do red onion as well, cabbage. I mean, it's funny, like the Israeli set. We call cucumber tomato salad here in the States Israeli salad. Israelis in Israel call it Arab salad. Shopscot is what Balkans call it. When I worked as a cook in Israel, there was um, uh, a Romanian dishwasher that would make what I thought was Israeli salad and we would add minced lettuce to it and just salt the hell out of it. So there was no lemon 
and like a little bit of oil and that was like Romanian salad. So this is our version, whatever you really want it to be. But the deal is, is that you chop it really, really fine. There's a fantastic restaurant, it's actually a Yemenite restaurant in Khadera, which is this sort of no-name town. Um, and one of my favorite parts of Israel is by Caesarea. I went to boarding school in Kurdistana. So there's this little restaurant um, called Opera, which uh, sounds like opera. It was certainly not a Yemenite word, right? <laughs> it was a German restaurant that I think was open maybe in the 60s or 70s. A Yemenite family bought it. They, um, it's one of my favorite restaurants ever. And they actually started, you know, in Israel, you can buy the malach, like the frozen malach in, in yeah. the different section. So that's actually how they like became famous. They make this amazing frozen malach, but then the family still has a sick restaurant that has the best Yemenite soup. And their Israeli salad has got minced cabbage in it, which is like awesome, you know? So I encourage you, honestly, whatever you've got going on, if you've got fresh herbs, chop the hell out of them and do it. The only thing that you don't want to do is overdress the salad. You want to use the salt very heavy. Yeah. Use a little bit of lemon, but don't toss it in tons of olive oil. I and mean, even, um, I make the mis this mistake all the time. You don't want to overdress it. Let the vegetables kind of speak for themselves. We have cucumber. We've got these like pretty good tomatoes. We're just gonna kind of chop these guys up. I don't know, Jake, what do you put in your salads, bro? I mean, so I do, I make a lot of like Shirazi salad to go with all the Persian food. And yeah. the, the same kind of argument, in, especially because a lot, I mean, Alex's mother uses some fresh, but also some dried herbs, which I, yeah. just, I just throw in whatever the hell I have. And then I put, I mean, because I'm Ashkenazi, I put dill in everything too. Yeah, we go dill. Dill, dill is like, yeah, dill is the best. Dill is the best. Dill is good and dried mints is like amazing. Dried mint is fantastic in salads. Um, tell us a little bit about what is your Shabbat look like? Is this kind of the first time, I assume your most Friday nights are at the restaurant, so. Yeah, I mean, that's the sort of conundrum. That's the conundrum with what I do is like, I would love to be able to celebrate Shabbat. Even I'm not very religious. I do love going to shul. I do like Saturday mornings are awesome. I do like the idea of, um, breaking bread and saying brachot and then just like, you know, maybe not turning off all electricity, but like only watching TV and like watching a movie. Like I, I do love that. I love the idea of waking up and, and going to services. It happens so infrequently just because of my schedule. It's, it's a problem you now. I mean, we can't just close on Fridays and Saturdays, but I feel like all the sort of rules, like the, you know, like, having a kosher restaurant and then selling it to a non-Jew over the weekend. That just seems a little weird too. So as of right now, you know, maybe, maybe next year, you know, there's something about this past month that really has made me appreciate being at home. Yeah. Um, and uh, not like I don't recognize the value of like spending time with family or anything, but we don't, you know, it's just not part of who we are. We, we push and we run and we like, produce all the time. So having the sort of mandated slowing down has been really wonderful. Maybe we'll have some more Shabbat dinners. You and I had spoke about that before this whole Balagan. So And now uh, we have to. Are we gonna do it? I think next month or so. That I mean, assuming that things go well, maybe we can do this next month. A hundred percent. Do we have anybody here that's watching this that'll come join us? Everyone can come. Yes. All three right. all four hundred people are welcome. Um yeah, I mean, that's, I, I love that, especially because, I mean, personally, I didn't grow up with Shabbat. So that is why I think, like, especially in moments like these, it's when the concept of when you're home 24-7, you're working, not working at home, having some kind of designation for other, um, yeah. for this one day that you really get to just, like, focus on yourself. Yeah. So you said you did grow up or did not grow up with Shabbat? I grew up with Shabbat. We yeah. grew up to my holidays, went to Hebrew school, but like we did not do Shabbat. Yeah, so we did like various degrees of Shabbat, you know? Um, sports and all that stuff sort of like ruined it a little bit, but I don't know. I, it's just, I love, I love how personal Judaism can be. It's, it's, it is sort of what you make of it, you know? And I feel like I'm a relatively secular person, but I feel like I'm, observant in so many other ways that are like certainly not mandated by the Torah, but, but that um, is 
Jewish thing to be. That is inherently Jewish. It is. It's constantly asking the question, constantly being critical and constantly exploring. And that is like what I'm the most proud of, you know, even discovering I, Jewish cuisine and, and understanding our relationship to it and how it tells the story of um, the diaspora and uh, the plight of Jews and conflict and commonality it is like such a beautiful thing. All right, so real quick though, tons of parsley. You'll do just a squeeze of lemon and a good amount of salt. Like I said, I'm kind of over this whole idea of just like oil, oil, oil on everything. We're gonna mix this up really, really nicely. Um, and we're gonna let it sit for a second and then we're gonna fry our schnitzel. Now, here's the deal. I almost got into an argument over social media the other day because I, made excellent schnitzel and I fried it in very fancy olive oil, okay? Now, when you're in culinary school, or if you read, like everyone says, smoke point, yada, yada, the truth is olive oil's got a smoke point, sometimes, depending on what it is, of up to 370 degrees, right? The flavor is fantastic. Frying in olive oil is maybe not the most cost effective, but can be delicious. Yeah. This is olive oil that has been on and it's not super fancy, but it's definitely awesome. This is olive oil that's been on the stove at medium heat. Your Before it gets that sort of wavy skillet. smoke. What'd you say? Your beautiful Great Jones skillet. Yeah, there you go, exactly. Thank you, Sierra. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna fry this not super hot because I want it to be, I want the meat to be tender. I want it to get crisp and wonderful, but I want the flavor to be great. Like if this is not about like we're not top chefing this. We're taking our time and we're making the schnitzel really, really nicely. You know, you do not have to use olive oil. You can use peanut, canola, grapeseed, whatever. This is what I like with my schnitzel, okay? How you much know? are you adding? Ooh, your video just went away. It did because somebody was trying to call me, okay? Um, so, how much oil uh, do you put in? How much oil? I cover the bottom of the pan. You know, we're like shallow frying it. Um, you know, and that's, and that's okay. Now, also the beautiful thing is with the olive oil is that you're almost forced to keep it not too hot, which means that you can like use it multiple times, right? You don't burn it out. So let's move everything out of the way. We've got our schnitzel. We've got our, let's see what else do we have? We've got our schnitzel, we've got our salad. Keeping our fingers crossed and hopefully our rice is in good shape. I've got a good feeling about it. Um, we're going to move everything up to the side here. You can see this guy going, it's like sort of a lazy bubble. I love that. I, that th I find that fascinating. We'll start working on our plate. Move on this out of the way, I'm running out of space. <laughs> I mean, this is so such a perfect menu for Shabbat, given the fact that you've literally put it completely together in less than an hour, um, which is a feat at my Shabbos table. Well, I think that also, like, when you're, like, Shabbat in quarantine with not too much stuff, Shabbat with kids, you want to whip something up, and this makes the best leftovers ever, you know? Mm. Give it a little flip. Oh, well. Gorge. All right, so while that's cooking, let's get our rice over here. Let's see how it works out. Okay, can you guys see? Beautiful. So some questions about, you talk all about the leftovers and obviously I love cold schnitzel, but yeah. what are kind of some of your reheating best practices for schnitzel? So actually, so schnitzel you can do in a low, like I would actually put in a, um, in like a little, uh, what do you call it? Like an oven slow thing, hold on a second. Somebody left me a voice now and it's annoying me. Okay. Um, so schnitzel, I would almost put like on a tray and cover it and reheat it really, really gently. Leftover schnitzel reheated is like not totally awesome. My dad, who's um, 
you know, my dad was always the first one to break Passover, always trying to sneak bacon into that. And like our house wasn't kosher, but we definitely didn't have pork in it. Okay. We always tried sneaking bacon. And my mom, whenever he would have to pack my lunches when I was in elementary school, it would be like Wonder Bread, butter, and cold chancel. You know, that was like his gone. There is, a, a it Jewish is so cat. good though. What'd you say? It's a Jewish katsu. Exactly. And you guys can't smell this, but really the olive oil, the way it's interacting with the meat is awesome. I'm gonna stick a little slice of lemon on top, okay? Amazing. All right, now we're gonna get to this rice here. Mm. Now this, you wanna be delicate with this part too, okay? You got the kale, you've got the onions, gonna mix it around real nice. And you can make this hours, hours and hours before and just let it chill. Mm. But this is the best thing. Race, uh, Jake, I know that you're a race guy, as I am. I mean, is there anything as good as a fresh pot of rice? Like, the answer is no, right? Nothing. It's, it's, it's funny because it's one of those things that people love kind of a lot of table side things. Yeah. You know, your audio just cut out for a second. Saying something about table side. Are you still out, Jake? It's okay. All right, so guys, hopefully I'm still in. Can everyone still hear me? Yes. All right. I'm Thumbs back. up. Okay. Good. Oh, you're back. Woo. Oof. Thank God. Okay, so what were you saying, bro? Table side what? Oh, the, like nothing, nothing compares when you flip like a tadik or a maklubo or even just open like a fresh pot of rice, just take the yeah. lid off, people just go crazy. It's true. It is true. Carbs. What's that? Carbs. Yes. Um, also, I just, I feel like, you know, properly cooked rice is not the easiest thing to do either. We're gonna give this one more flip. So we got the lemon in here. Amazing. I'm really, really into the like medium heat olive oil. I think that's the way. I mean, listen, there's a place in Tel Aviv by the beach, Schnitzel Tion. Did you ever eat there or no? I have not. It's sick, right? And they deep fry it. It is sensational. It is like amazing, amazing schnitzel. Um, it's very different, you know, it's stuck. You get it on like a platter or whatever. I always get it in a pita, you know, like from the beach. I usually have a towel around my waist and you eat like bent over so you don't get like pina and like harif all over you. Um, and that's a fantastic circle that's very, very thin. This is a little bit, this is more dinner, right? It's a little yeah. more stuff. All right, so let me take this guy out. Thank you, pencil. Everyone watching, I hope you make this menu tomorrow. Be sure to tag Mike, one table, everyone, if you make this for your own Shabbat. Oh, perfect. Just as the few reminders just got posted. Okay. So we'll go with this guy down. I put that lemon on, just that slice of lemon last second, mm. which you don't have to do at all, but you absolutely should. Um, and then we're going to go a little tina right out of the container here. Zahav plating at home. This is it. Tell me a little bit about what the restaurants are offering. I know you have, like, you do takeout um, Shabbat dinners. Yeah. Yeah, so we're doing, uh, we did a Shabbat yesterday, um, or actually, it was picked up today, and that's sort of like, uh, everything is done, um, challah, 
hummus, a bunch of salads, and then we do um, we did this um, short rib that you basically bake in your oven for like mm. six hours at 275. Totally awesome. We did a really cool uh, Passover thing. Uh, Merkaz is doing um, like a whole zatar chicken and a whole head of cauliflower takeout thing. Next week we'll have a little kvar goldie. I mean, you know, trying to trying to keep it real. It's not you know, it's not like. Nobody's really sure of what the proper protocol for anything is. Staying open or only doing takeout consistently isn't, as of right now, something that's prudent. Um, so it's basically what we're doing. And then I'm doing a lot of stuff, doing a lot of this stuff, you know? I'm like hanging out, cooking a bunch and just sort of recording it and seeing what happens, Lovely. which has been super satisfying. So. Amazing. Okay, let's do a little like little red lobster finish. Boom. <laughs> yeah, clean up. Love it. Cell, salad, some rice. So easy. Listen, do me a favor. You don't need even the butter, but leftover challah, cold tuna sauce, cold schnitzel, slice of tomato, I love perhaps it. zatar if you have it. There was nothing better. I'm very. I'm making a challah tomorrow, so I will. I will definitely have to get some chicken breast too. Make some schnitzel. Good. And listen, we do have to have like Shabbat together. Yes. Okay. Yes, of course. Um, thank you so much for doing this, Mike. This was so 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 amazing. Thank um, you, one table. Shabbat shalom to everyone out there. Thank you guys so so much. Thanks for uh, allowing me to be part of this community, and it really. Makes me feel good. And I didn't set my kitchen on fire yet, which is good. And the UPS truck didn't come, <laughs> which is a, a bummer. But um, I mean, it was perfect yeah. completely. Take care. Thank you See so you much. Guys. For everyone watching, thank you so much for joining. Remember, Friday Night with One Table is all about feeling good. We want to make this kind of as sustainable as possible in this new time while staying safe and maintaining social distancing practices. We've changed everything to make sure that you can be nourished, whether it's just you and your roommates or doing a virtual Shabbat. Um, we'll be hosting a few dinners on One Table Live, um, as well as you can see our entire virtual community to find a virtual Shabbat for yourself. Um, we're here to help you however way to make sure Shabbat stays in your life. Thanks, Mike. I hope to see you soon when it's all done. Yeah, take care. Jake. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Bacha.